My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Executive Director of the Congregational Library and Archives. Welcome to today's virtual discussion with Dr. R.J.M. Blackett to celebrate the release of his wonderful new book, Samuel Ringgold Ward, A Life of Struggle. To begin with, I want to acknowledge that the Congregational Library and Archive resides in what is now known as Boston, which is in the place of the Blue Hills, the homeland of the Massachusetts people, whose relationships and connections with the land continue to this day and into the future. Juneteenth is a federal holiday honoring the emancipation of enslaved African Americans. It commemorates the anniversary of the order proclaiming freedom for enslaved people in Texas on June 19th, 1865. That was two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation had freed enslaved people in states like Texas, which had rebelled against the United States. Enslaved people fought hard and at great risk for their emancipation, and we remember them on this day. For those joining us for the first time, the Congregational Library and Archives is an independent research library. Established in 1853, the CLA's mission is to foster a deeper understanding of the spiritual, intellectual, civic, and cultural relevance and dimensions of the congregational story and its ongoing relevance in the 21st century. We do this through free access to our research library of 225,000 books, pamphlets, periodicals, and manuscripts, as well as our digital archive, which has more than 100,000 images, many drawn from our New England's Hidden Histories project. Throughout the year, we offer educational programs and research fellowships for students, scholars, churches, and anyone interested in Congregationalism's influence on the American story. Please do check out our website, congregationallibrary.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. And please let me now go ahead and uh, invite uh, our speaker to join us. Uh, R.J. M. Blackett is a historian of the abolitionist movement whose books include The Captive's Quest for Freedom, Fugitive Slaves, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, and the Politics of Slavery, and Making Freedom, the Underground Railroad and the Politics of Slavery. He is Andrew Jackson Professor of History Emeritus at Vanderbilt University and lives in Nashville, Tennessee. And we are so excited, uh, Professor Blackett, for you to join us today and to hear about a great congregationalist, as well as a great man of many other talents uh, in history. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Carl. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, there are four observations about war that I want to start with uh, and to build a talk around. As he looked back over many years in the trenches, Frederick Douglass said of Ward, as an orator and thinker, he was vastly superior, I thought, to any of us. And being perfectly black and of a mixed African descent, the splendors of his intellect went directly to the glory of race. In depth of thought, fluency of speech, readiness of wit, logical exactness and general intelligence, Samuel R. Ward has left no successor among the colored men amongst us. And it was a sad day for our cause when he was laid low in the soil of a foreign country. Another contemporary, James McEwen, Dr. James McEwen Smith, uh, a fellow schoolmate of Ward said, uh, he called him the ablest thinker on his legs that Anglo-Africa has produced, whose power of eloquence, brilliant repartee, and stubborn logic are as well known in England as in the United States. Ward's cousin, the Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, wondered why someone of such talent as he said, was never sustained by his people. And finally, William J. Wilson, who wrote regularly for Frederick Douglass's newspaper and who had worked with Ward, when he heard that Ward was going to England in 1853, thought he, was, thought he would have an incredible impact on the struggle to win international support for abolition. But he worried that Ward did not always keep what he called a proper command of his inner self. 
These observations, I think, provide us with some contemporary assessments of Ward's talents, the contributions he made to the struggle against the twin evils of slavery and discrimination in the United States, Canada, and Britain, his temperament, and his decision to cut ties with the United States. Above all else, it is a story of the course Ward paid for attacking the system. A brief biography. Ward was one of a group of African-American leaders dismissed by a Garrisonian abolitionist as the Maryland Boys. They included Douglas, Garnett, Pennington, and Ward. All were born slaves on the eastern shore of Maryland. Unlike the others, Ward did not know where exactly he was born. In fact, he did not know he was born a slave until he was an adult. His mother kept it a guarded secret until Ward was 24. We first hear of his birth in the opening lines of his autobiography published in London in 1855. It may be one of the most cryptic opening lines of a memoir. He says, I was born on the 17th of November, 1817, in that part of the state of Maryland, the United States, commonly called the Eastern Shore. That does not give the biographer much to go on. I often wonder what the news of his, of his being born a slave had on him. Unlike Douglas, he rarely made mention of, of the fact publicly. In the day after his mother's visit, Ward broke the news in a letter to his confidant, Gerard Smith, in what, much, in what must stand as one of the greatest understatements. He had more important news to convey to Smith, such as his continued indebtedness and the need to sell his home to meet his debts. Ward says he suspected he was born a slave, but curiously, I can find only two mentions of it in any of his public statements. After a brief stay in the Pine Barrens of Southern New Jersey, following their escape, the family settled in the relative safety of New York City, where Ward attended the African Free School. The school's alumni included some of the leading African-Americans of the antebellum period, including James McEwen Smith, who got three degrees from the University of Glasgow, including his medical degree, Alexander Crummel, who, like Smith, was not permitted to enter a college of higher education, and so took his degree from the University of Cambridge, and William Howard Day, who was a graduate of Oberlin. Ward experienced the full force of American racism when a white mob attacked an anti-slavery meeting he attended in 1834. He resisted, and for that, he was arrested and imprisoned. It was a baptism of fire and an introduction to the struggle that would come to dominate his life for the next 20 years. During the period, he was a prominent figure in multiple battles against discrimination in schools and other forms of segregation, especially in churches, in the struggle to return the vote to Black New Yorkers and in the effort to destroy slavery. He taught school for a while in Long Island and Newark before moving to Poughkeepsie, New York, where he continued his education with the help of an unnamed tutor. There in 1839, he faced another crisis of what he called Negro hate. He and his tutor were working to form a literary society. When invitations were sent out, Ward discovered his name was not included. The tutor thought his inclusion would wreck any hope of attracting the support of whites. Ward was so hurt, he started making plans to leave the country with his wife. The apprenticeship scheme, which had followed emancipation in the West Indies, had just ended, bringing that final emancipation to the enslaved of the area. Trinidad planters were desperate for labor and turned to the United States to fill their needs. Ward wrote to take up the offer. Friends in the anti-slavery society, however, got wind of his plans and not wanting to lose such a talent, 
offered him an agency. Ward accepted and decided to stay. But this was one of many moments in his life when such denials of basic human rights prompted him to consider leaving the country. It was during the lecture tour of upstate New York that a small congregation in South Butler invited Ward to be their minister, a black man ministering to a white church. The call was both a tribute and a challenge. Parts of the North, and if not America, took notice. The call also raised Ward's spirit. It was a hopeful sign, but Ward knew the country's eyes were now on him and his small congregation. By most measures, the years spent there were a success, but more, Ward made little headway attracting any black residents to the church. It remained a white congregation ministered to by a black man. More troubling, Ward found it impossible to make ends meet. Debts mounted. In the end, he left to take up an appointment at a larger white church in Cortland, New York. It did little to improve his finances. Poverty stalked the first and only black man to minister to white congregationists in the 19th century. Ward spent the better part of the 1840s immersed in the struggle against slavery and the effort to return the vote to black New Yorkers. Much of his effort went cent was centered on the Liberty Party, the third party formed by abolitionists at the beginning of the, the 1840s. He became one of the party's leading voices, both as editor and lecturer. He was, as some opponents put it, the party's big gun. William Wells Brown, no supporter of the party, claimed that Ward lectured in every county in the state and in most of its churches, insisting that no true opponent of slavery could vote for a party that bent its knees to slavery. The Negro had to stand fast against the political forces of slavery and discrimination that dominated both major parties at the time, the Whigs and the Democrats. It troubled Ward that there were Blacks who voted for the Whigs as the lesser of two evils. It was, he insisted, a wasted vote. He never conceded, however, that a principal vote for the Liberty Party was no less wasted. The party, after all, was swept in the both presidential elections of 1840 and 1844. Ward worried that a significant number of Blacks and white abolitionists turned their attention to the Free Soil Party in 1848 as a sort of successor of the Liberty Party. He attended the party's convention in Buffalo, the one mentioned by Douglas, attended by 20,000 on a sweltering hot August day. Ward gave a rousing speech, then promptly left the meeting. On his return home, he eschewed what he called an address to the 4,000 colored voters of the state of New York. It was a scathing attack on the party and those Blacks who supported it. Those who would vote for the Whig ticket was, were acting treasonably, he wrote. Those who promoted the Free Soil Party were artful demagogues, acting no less treasonably. They should be ignored because the 4,000 Black votes held in their hands the balance of power. The party, he warned, was not committed to equal rights. Martin Van Buren, its prospective presidential candidate, had consistently opposed the abolition of slavery in Washington, D.C. A vote for Van Buren would be a vote for a, as he called it, a pro-slavery candidate with a pro-slavery party. Rejecting the party's advances was the only way to show the country that the black men of New York had what he called too much self-respect to be bribed, cajoled, cheated, or flattered into pro-slavery voting. His solution, vote only for those who abhorred slavery, advocated for its extinction, and who supported the rights of blacks to vote. It left blacks few options, however. He and Douglas entered a lengthy, sometimes edgy exchange over the merits of the new party. As Douglas eased his way from the Garrisonian rejection 
of all particip political participation. Douglas had to admit that Ward had inflicted some of the most powerful blows, as he said, ever dealt upon the thick skulls of American prejudice against colored persons. While his differences with Douglas never degenerated into insults, Ward could be harsh with other blacks, especially those in New York City who continued to support the Whigs. He pleaded with them, sometimes berated, even insulted them, yet they were unmoved. He despaired they were, as he said, hireable and coaxable enough to do the dirty deeds of meanness. It was reactions like these that led uh, Wilson, William, Wilson, William Wilson to wonder if Ward had control of what he called his inner self. When he was criticized for lecturing to a segregated audience in Philadelphia, Ward dismissed his critics as shameless and impudent. Close friends cross Ward at their peril. When he heard Jermaine Logan had said some unflattering things about him in a letter meant only for the eyes of the recipient, he recalled it was not the first time his old friend had used pen and tongue in what he calls secretly trying to injure a man, and therefore it is less manly and more base. As in the case of his mentor in Poughkeepsie, racial slights drew from Ward damning criticism. While in England, he attended a soiree at Stafford House, the palatial home of the Duchess of Sutherland, at which Elizabeth Greenfield, the black swan, the first major black op uh, opera singer, gave a musical recital. The Duchess was the patron of both Greenfield and Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was then on the tour of England. After the performance, guests toured the house and grounds to the strains of bagpipes. Ward did not miss the irony of the event. A strange tableau, he remembered, and a sight for sore eyes, as he wrote Stafford House, British nobility, and a negress. Stowe was struck by the attention Ward attracted and the ease with which he circulated among the guests. She described him as the full-blooded African, tall enough for a palm tree, in easy conversations with the aristocracy, sustaining him modestly, but with self-possession. When Ward read her description of the evening in her book, The Sunny Memoirs, which he published later as an account of her time in Britain, he was unimpressed. It was another example of Ward's pandering to, of, sorry, of White's pandering to Negro hate. For all her praise of him, Stowe could not bring herself to tell her readers, Ward Greit, that she entered the hall on his arms, on the arms of a black man. Stowe knew that to have done so, Ward argued, would have cut into the sales of her book in the United States. Yet as Stowe pointed out, Ward was comfortable in the company of whites who showed him respect. Ward had moved to Peterborough, New York in the early 1840s because it was known as the most abolitionized community anywhere in New York, influenced by Gerald Smith, the largest landowner in the state, and the man who became Ward's mentor and supporter. It mattered to Ward uh, that Smith em empathized with the struggle of African-Americans that he had placed himself, as Ward said, in a black skin. When Ward got to London a decade later, he and Stowe and the Stowe family made their home at the Reverend James Sherman, a prominent congregational minister, to be welcome into the home of a person who he had only recently met and who insisted he stayed as long as he liked was more than anything Ward could have anticipated. It was toward a meaningful gesture of friendship and disinterested philanthropy. The two developed the last in friendship. Ward described his new friend as a man of feeling as well as a man of honor, who places at one disposal whatever he has, whatever he can do, and rejoices in any sacrifice to accommodate whoever may have the good fortune to be admitted to his intimate acquaintance. 
Ward was in England to raise funds for the Canadian Anti-Slavery Society and its work to support the rising number of fugitives who fled there in the wake of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. At his first public meeting with the stores, Exola Hall in London was packed to the rafters. Pickpockets had a field day until the police interview, intervened. Ward was the star speaker, the author of Uncle Tom's basking modestly in the crowd's adoration. Ward's speech combined a scathing attack on the American church with personal experiences, including the way he was treated on the British ship on its way to Liverpool. It was a, right, a rousing introduction to his mission. Wherever he went in his two years stay in Britain, he was warmly received. His presence and eloquence transfixed his listeners. Those who heard him left compelled to put to paper their experiences, some of which strikes the modern ear as widely exaggerated, flailing, sailing close to racist hyperbole. One newspaper man in Sligo, Ireland, may have been the most extravagant in his response to Ward's address. Ward, he told his readers, was not a common man. His person and bearings are very striking. His manners are those of a polished gentleman. His vocabulary is copious and well chosen. His mind is more matter of fact, quite so than imaginative, more of an English than was usually conceived as the African type. Another, another in Ireland, in Dublin, had more to say. He said his voice of thunder, which would be, which would at the head of an advanced column in the battlefield rival the peal of artillery, was scientifically suppressed to suit his audience. Many who heard Ward speak thought as Wendell Phillips did, that his tongue was inspired by oppression. Those who came to hear him were so impressed by his physique, his size, his height, and his color, what one called his Herculean frame. A race that produced the lights of Ward and Toussaint Louverture of Haiti, one Irish reporter concluded, ought not to be enslaved. Douglas, Garnett, McEwen Smith, and others who knew him cherished his genius and what he contributed to the cause. Jane Swisshelm, editor of the Pittsburgh Sunday Saturday Visitor, thought him as fine a specimen of a black man as any friend of the race need wish to present as a refutation of all assertions of the inferiority of the African. He is so big, so black, so evidently at peace with himself with all a shadow of assumption of pomposity that at first glance once sets him down as a man of well-balanced intellect. She goes on, he looks so entirely good-humored, yet calm and dignified that we were not surprised to hear there was far more laughter than crying in his audience and that the keenest edge is given to his satire by the perfect good humor in which it is uttered. It may be the best description of Ward's power as an orator, of his ability to reach audiences even in the most, even the most hostile with a mix of humor, passion, and reason. It was what impressed Douglas at, at the Buffalo meeting of the Free Soil Party. Together they frequently confronted and sometimes converted hostile audiences. When Isaac Rinders and his Tammany Hall rowdies took over a meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society in New York City in 1861, Ward and Douglas kept them at bay. Rinders insisted that Douglas was not really a Negro, only as he said, half a nigger. Douglas agreed he was the son of a slaveholder, which he said, turning to Rinders, made him half a brother of Mr. Rinders. Douglas then gave way to Ward. Rinders greeted him, here is a regular black savage. What followed was a masterful stroke. I, I care not for my li lineage, Ward began, and ask not whether I am descended from a man or a monkey. One thing he knew, he was a man, and the God who made him intended he should, as he said, have the rights to and perform the duties of a man. He had the faculty of thought and the capacity of, a of affection and emotion. 
He had a human tongue to speak and a human heart to feel. Ward then drove home his point. He wondered how many white men in the audience had what he called low receding foreheads of which you might say of the schoolmaster in Dickens, Nicholas Nickleby, that if you knock the all day, you'll find nobody at home. The audience roared and Rylands retreated a little. Everything Ward said, according to one reporter, indicated education and culture. The pride he took in his color thrilled the audience. His wit was, as the reporter self, set off by an intonation which gave the fullest effect of his thoughts. Their white protagonists were put down, half covered by a couple of black noblemen. This black nobleman had done everything he knew to improve himself to de demonstrate he was both educated and cultured. He was an ordained minister, a lecturer of some reputation, a newspaper editor. He was the first black to be nominated for vice presidency of a political party. He had toyed with the idea of training to become a lawyer and a doctor. He had, in other words, done all contemporary America could have expected of one of his citizens, yet he could never make ends meet. The wolves were always at his family's door. He was, forced, he was forced to sell his first house to pay off debts. He pleaded with friends for support. Many of those who subscribed to his newspaper rarely sent in their payments in time. That forced him to go on the road in all manner of weather, lecturing and raising subscriptions. He spent weeks away from home. Our debtors, he wrote in 1849, won't let us obey the scriptures. We work hard and constantly, and had we received a respectable portion of what we have earned during the last 11 months, we might have been free from debt. He ended plaintively, it's hard. He moved the newspaper first to Syracuse and then Boston, searching for larger markets. The situation did not improve. As he put it, after smattering away on teaching, law, medicine, divinity, and public lecturing, I am neither lawyer, doctor, teacher, divine, or lecturer. The situation grew progressively worse, so much so that he was forced into debtor's court in Boston. After a particularly long lecture tour to the West, he and his wife decided that there was little keeping them in the United States. They would seek greater, greener pastures in Canada. On their way home, an event in Syracuse helped them confirm the decision. Ward was a leading participate participant in the rescue of Jerry, a fugitive slave from Missouri. The government made it clear that those involved would be prosecuted. A fugitive slave himself, Ward saw the need to leave the country. The family settled in Toronto. Henry followed him. Pleased to be employed by the American Missionary Association went largely unanswered. Again, he went on the road lecturing and raising funds for the Anti-Slavery Society of Canada. His salary was never enough to meet the needs of his family. He jumped at an offer to become the society's agent in Britain. The society agreed to cover the family's rent and to provide periodic assistance while he was away. He supplemented his paltry salary with funds raised at a mind-numbing number of lectures. He was hit, but these barely covered his expenses. Everyone, including his wife, expected Ward to return at the end of his 18 months agency in Britain, but he was in such demand that he extended his stay twice at the end of which he announced that he was going to Jamaica. He had been given, he had been given land there by an English supporter who hoped he would attract Black Americans to join him in an agricultural free produce project. Ward, however, had no experience in the management of such projects or even of sustained agricultural labor. Jamaica's economy at the, in, at the time was in shambles, riven by political tensions between estate owners and small landholders and peasants demanding more land. Cholera and smallpox epidemic had racked the island in the early years of the 1840s. To add to these problems, Ward left un London under a cloud of suspicion. While he was putting the finishing touches to his autobiography, he borrowed money from an English cheesemaker who was planning to emigrate to Canada with his family. 
Ward promised to repay the man once he got to Toronto. The Englishman turned up at Ward's apartment to find that Ward was not there and the family living in poverty. Ward was not profligate, nor was he a swindler, but he had been living hand to mouth for all his adult life so far, even ever since he took up his first teaching job. The situation may have gotten the better of him. Ward temporarily fell from view in Kingston. The rumor did the wrongs that he had been convicted of fraud and sent to the infamous prison on Van Diemen's Island in present-day Tasmania. Old friends would not believe it. In moving to Jamaica, Ward stepped off the pages of American history. I could find no mention of him in American sources. He lost contact with old friends. When one upstate New York editor sent him an issue of his paper, Ward cherished it, for it proved, sadly, he was not entirely forgotten. It would be two years or before the family could afford the price of a boat ticket to Kingston. It is not always clear what Ward did to earn a living. He passed to the Baptist church in the capital. Church politics in Jamaica was nothing if not bizarre. Pastorates in Jamaica, especially those in the large non-denominations, change hands with breathtaking frequency. There were Baptist churches associated with English churches, others with local synods, and yet others who were native Baptists steeped in African traditions. For a while, Ward led a congregation that splintered from the largest Baptist church in the world. He also got involved in politics that royally ailing leading to the Moran Bay Rebellion in October 1865. Led by Paul Bogle, a, small, a black small landowner, and supported by William Gordon, a colored member of the island assembly, the rebellion was the most politically consequential event in the years since emancipation. Both Bogle and Gordon were captured and summarily executed. In a short pap pamphlet published in early 1866, in, and in testimony before a commission sent out by the British to investigate the causes of the rebellion, Ward denounced, denounced the leaders of the rebellion and supported the bloody reaction of the authorities in crushing the rebels. His position has continued to confound historians. Here was a proud black man who made much of his attachment to and support of the rights of his people a man who in the United States was a driving force in the movement to eliminate slavery and racial discrimination, siding with the colonists in their efforts to deny the rights of black Jamaicans. There's no doubt that he was an avid promoter of the cause of the island's black small landholders and peasants. They were the backbone of the country's economy. He told them frequently, pleading with them to be patient. The island did not rely on the large absentee landowners, he told them, nor their local representatives for its survival. The future laid with those who were the most productive, the black farmers and settlers. They were, however, Ward believed being led astray by Gordon, a mulatto politician. It is the only time in his life that Ward betrayed any animus to mixed race people. In America, he sometimes poked fun at Douglas for being mixed race, but there's no evidence that it ever drifted into hatred. In Jamaica, however, such class and color differences matter, and Ward may have been exploiting them for his own benefit. If he was angling for performance from the colonial state, they never came. He taught school, pastored a small congregation outside Kingston, then fell off the pages of history. We have no idea where he died or what became of his family. Douglas gets the last word. It was a sad day for the cause when Ward, he said, was laid low in the soil of a foreign country. A major advocate for the slave, for the slave had simply vanished from the pages of history. In a preface to a reprinting of Ward's autobiography in 1970, in Vincent Hardin wondered how to explain why one of the most effective campaigners against slavery as he rode drops out of sight into the hills of Jamaica at the height of his manhood powers. Biographers could not end suspended in such uncertainty, but then Ward was no ordinary subject. Thank you.
Great, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, so as questions are coming in, um, Richard, I guess I wanna maybe start a little bit with his autobiography. And, yeah. you know, so published 1855, right in London, and then I think probably out of print for a long time until that 1970 edition. Is there a reason um, that his autobiography isn't maybe more of a canonical text um, these days? I mean, it feels like I, I, I was looking on WorldCat to see if I could find many reprints, you know, since that 1971, and there looks like there's, you know, maybe one in 2018 or so. But is there a reason why maybe it's not taught as much or seen as much as, say, Frederick Douglass's autobiography or other leaders? Yeah, yeah. I think the answer to that question is that it is not a slave narrative. Okay. It's an autobiography of a free man mm. that covers his his work, uh, in his struggles against slavery and racial discrimination, and his work in the United States, Canada, and and Britain. It ends, in fact, in eighteen fifty five after it's published, and he goes to Jamaica. So it's it's a, an account of his life mm -hmm. uh, with all the gaps that comes with it yep. uh, up to eighteen hundred roughly eighteen hundred and fifty nine. So I, I I think it's because it is not a slave narrative that it hasn't become part of the canon, the sort of things that we teach. But if you want an, an account of somebody next to say Frederick Douglass's um, autobiog autobiog later biographies memoirs. Yep. I think there are a few that surpass it. Uh, but the other thing about the autobi autobiography that that struck me as impressive, and it's something that I use to uh, to tell my graduate students when they are complaining about when they are lamenting about writing a dissertation. Uh, Ward Ward wrote a four hundred page book without notes <laughs> in the, the, in a matter of four months, locked up in his hotel room. It shows a kind of dedication and application that I don't understand. <laughs> that really is, it really is impressive. Yep. Uh, and I know he didn't take his notes with him, so I have to take him at his word. He did this without his notes. Uh, but it shows also a, a power of recall that is equally as impressive because there's, he, he replicates a speech that he gave at that Jerry Rescue event in Syracuse uh, in 1851. Uh, and I have I've gone back and looked at the newspaper accounts of his speech, and it's spot on. It's almost identical to the speech that he made. Uh, so he had a, an amazing power of recall. He had amazing power of hard work an application and i think that's that all went into producing the autobiography oh, that's great that's very i suspect i suspected he thought it would make him some money but i don't think it did all right the uh so uh, i think a question that naturally sort of falls from this is from an attendee asking can ward's lectures speeches the autobiography be found online so I wonder if you might talk a little bit about how much of Ward you were able to find during the pandemic as you're kind of working on this yeah. fine editions and how much of Ward's story is really still in the archives and the libraries that people have to go visit. Well, um, when I was working in my, on my first book many, many decades ago, um, uh, I, I tracked, I got a lot of his speeches from British newspapers. Mm -hmm. And working at the same time was a, a group of, of, um, of historians at Florida State University working with, um, aided by a number of their graduate students who pulled together what was called the Black Abolitionist Papers, mm -hmm. which is an incredible collection uh, uh, it, it's both on microfilm, which is nobody uses anymore, uh, but it's also published in about four or five volumes, uh, uh, and which you can find at most academic libraries. 
Um, and it's a wonderful source because it, it has a number of his letters and speeches uh, that have survived. But we have lost much of it. Right. So. And I, I see we have a comment uh, in here from somebody who's watching <clears throat> that uh, there's some ward material available at uh, the U United uh, University of North Carolina site, docsouth, uh, .unc edu. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if people want to uh, check that out. Uh, another great question in here from Susan Dixon Smith. Uh, she writes, uh, at what point did Ward come in contact with congregationalism? She's a history grad student studying Black congregational history in the Northeast, and she found your talk absolutely fascinating, and she can't wait to read the book. But you know, so Ward kind of growing up in Maryland, not really a hot spot of congregationalism. No, no. How did, how no. did he come into that world? <laughs> I have, I, I have, I am sorry to, to say this to the graduate student. I have no idea. Um, he, he is. He becomes, they say he becomes a Congregationalist in 1839 or just before, mm -hmm. is what we know. And the churches that he ministered to in upstate New York, in South Butler, which is way up in the north of New York, is, it's a small Congregationalist church made up largely of migrants from New England. And the second church that he ministered to in Cortland, New York, is also a Congregationalist church. And both of those churches, the congregations were white. And so, so the only black fam the only black people in the congregation were Ward and his and his family. Mm -hmm. um, so it is it's it's a curious so, sort of thing. So I have no I have no way of knowing why he became a congregationalist. Um, I suspect he was influenced by Amos Beeman. Who is a well-known black congregationalist who, who whose church, uh, prominent church in New Haven, and whose whose papers are at Yale University, but they don't provide too much. There's also uh, Simeon Jocelyn, who a white congregationalist with whom he was very close. But if we look at his contemporaries at the school at which he attended, the the, um, the African Free School. Uh, William Howard Day is A.M.E. Zion. Yep. Um, Alexander Crummel is Episcopalian. Uh, Henry Highland Garnett is a Presbyterian, who is his cousin. So I, 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 I can't, I can't tag any links to early Congregationalists in New York City that would lead me to think that he would, he would become a Congregationalist. So. Um, why people chose what church they belong to in this generation, I think defies, defies historians to, to come up with a, a, a real, an explanation that, is, that, that meets much of the historical problems that we try to resolve. So I have no way of knowing why, why Ward chose to become a congregationalist. Uh, there's a few more questions that are sort of in that line about people that he had contact with and maybe, you know, maybe a question for you about how your understanding of the relationship he had with different activists has changed as a result of doing your research. Um, so uh, AJ, I'm going to mispronounce this, Acerife asks, you know, says, thank you for this important, valuable work. Did you come across any information about Ward's relationship with Robert Purvis, for example? No. No, because Purvis, Purvis headquarters really is in, in Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, and Ward, Ward may have, vi Ward visited Philadelphia a, a few times, but uh, it, it's in Philadelphia that he made that terrible error of agreeing to lecture to a segregated audience. Right. And got him, and got him deeply in trouble with, with his, including Frederick Douglass, who came closest to, to savaging him in, 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 in his reports and in his newspaper. Um, so no, Ward, Ward tended to, to do, every, most of his activity happened east of the, the Alleghenies. Right. To put, a, to put a kind of geographical limit on it. So another uh, person though, he might've had more interaction with, 
Could you talk about Ward's relationship with Marianne Shad, the first black female newspaper editor in North America? Did they, or did he kind of just hand off the newspaper to her? Do they have a working relationship? Well, it, it's, it's very brief because okay. the newspaper, the newspaper puts out one issue mm -hmm. while he was in Canada when, and, and he was sort of like the figurehead editor. By this time, Ward is deeply suspicious. Ward, he said he'd been beaten up so badly uh, publishing his own newspaper in New York that he really didn't have want to, to do anything more with newspaper publishing. But Mary Anshad persuaded him that he should become involved. So he lent his name as a sort of editor of the newspaper, as he did with William Howard Day's Alien America, which came out which had a couple issues also that came out. But then Ward left for England. Um, he corresponded with Chad while he was in England uh, and she uh, was very supportive of him. And she like Douglas kept pestering him to return mm -hmm. because they said the struggle is on this side of the Atlantic and not in England. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she was deeply disappointed when Ward decided to go to Jamaica. She thought that was not the place for American, American freed people to go. They should go. They should come to Canada, as far as Chad was concerned. So the the relationship, the intimacy of the relationship is limited to a very brief period, in in eighteen fifty four, um, and not, although they were on both sides of certain pivotal quarrels. They were on the same side in, on, on pivotal quarrels involving uh, efforts to establish black settlements in, in, in Canada. But by, by and large, no, it, it's, very, it's a very limited uh, relationship. There's interest here. I think people are maybe sharing uh, the, the seeming puzzlement that comes at the end of his life. And uh, so uh, has been a longtime friend of the Congregation Library asked, uh, Professor Blackett, how would you explain the back of Ward's backing of the colonial administration in Jamaica? I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about where he sort of falls at the end of his, of what we know of his life. I, I, I mean, I struggled with this one. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it, it it doesn't square with anything that he has done before. Um, and I think partly is that he um, he became deeply distrusted, distrustful of William Gordon, who is the, one of the leaders of the Moran Bay rebellion. Gordon was a was a very powerful uh, political figure and landowner, a very prominent man, a very um, e economically well-to-do Jamaican, uh, a man of mixed race. His father, Gordon's father had been a slaveholder who had set him up in sort of to su succeed. Uh, and Ward at one point in, in a testament uh, said that he had met Gordon in London while, while he was over there and that, um, and that Gordon slighted him. And there's nothing that drew the ire of Ward than people slighting him. He would not have it. And therefore, he was not willing to work with anything that, that Gordon promoted while he was in Jamaica. That's number one. The second thing is that he thought that Gordon was leading, leading the poor people astray. That this was politically unwise, what they were doing. Because as I mentioned in the talk, Ward believed that the, uh, firmly believed that the future of the island's economy and its uh, and its success rested with the small working men of Jamaica, uh, and he kept saying that to them. He said, "It's not the rich landowners that are going to do this because they are squandering their they are living their ill-gotten gains in England, not the merchants of Kingston." but the small landholders, and he says, what you have to do is be patient, it will come. And, but, but by 1865, there were few people who were promoting patience. So Ward was completely out 
uh, out of out of line with with most of the political developments. But why he threw in his lot, why he supported the governor in his reaction to the rebellion, I will never know. Mm. Uh, it makes it makes no historical, no logical, no in no in no other sense can I find a way to justify it. To, ex to explain it even before I could justify it. I can't explain it. Um, and he stuck, he stuck with the governor even after the governor was recalled by the British government. Um, and one wonders if he, if, he, if he decided that his future was, that he would get to re reap some reward for his support of the government. But I don't know. I really can't tell. And I'm only speculating. And people who have looked at Ward have tried their best to explain it, but they can't really explain it. I mean, it, it, it's clear to me that by not long after he had moved to Canada, Ward began to see himself and to speak as if he were a British citizen rather than an American. In fact, the first letter he wrote to, to Frederick Douglass after he moved to Canada is he said, Fred, you take America it's, and all its madness. I want nothing to do with it. Uh, I am done. Yeah. Of course, he couldn't be done he could, because the ties are too great. But nonetheless, he started seeing himself as a British citizen. Mm -hmm. So when he was discriminated against on the boat trip on a ship, owned by a British company crossing the Atlantic to Liverpool. Um, he made a lot of that. that he, so, so it is possible that by the time he gets to Jamaica, uh, you know, he is fully sees himself as a British citizen or as a British subject, I think is the word that he kept using, not citizen. Uh, so that may help to explain it, but I, I am, I am, averse to, 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 to putting all these things together and coming up with a conclusion that would, that would help to explain it. It's yeah. a mystery. It's a mystery. And, you know, and that's, and as we know well, that, that happens, you know, those silences in the archives that either, yep. you know, either he, he wanted to remain out of the archive and he wanted to preserve that silence or that others decided uh, not to include his voice. Um, there's a, but I, mu yeah. I must admit, I should add also that when what I have discovered, what I, I think I have discovered in this and other work that I have done is when Americans, particularly black Americans, leave the United States, they walk off the pages of, of, of American history. They are no longer America. Hmm. America doesn't see them as America. Right. Um, and Ward, I suspect, is one of those. Um, and I mean, I, I have not found a single obituary of Ward. Wow. Yeah. It, it has haunted me. I and I'm hope I, I was hoping when the book or I'm not hope is the wrong word. I I suspected when the book came out, I would get some letter saying or email saying there's an obituary in the in the whatever, whatever gazette. Yeah. Not not a word. Uh, and that is a mystery. Wow. So all so the, why Ward supported the governor of Jamaica in 1865 is one of the many mysteries that surround his life. This, this next question might be a similar mystery given where it falls. It's from Daniel Wright. And he asks, is there any record of Ward's reaction to the American Civil War? Not a word. Wow. Oh, there's one, there's one, one context he, in which he criticizes the way that the Jamaican economy is run because it imports everything, even from the United States, even as he says, it imports stuff that they could grow in Jamaica. They've choose to import it from the United States. And he finds that totally unacceptable. Uh, and he makes a, one other reference to, uh, in making a comparison to what was going on in Jamaica in 1865, to, to what was happening uh, in America. But that that is, those are only tangential. He does not, comment at all because he no longer he no longer has a newspaper in which he can 
he can write, express his views on things. Uh, and the correspondence from him uh, while he was in Jamaica is very, very limited. Uh, there are far, far too many questions here. <laughs> So I, I, I'm going, Richard, I'm going to send all these questions to you after the talk. Just so, so I want everybody in the virtual audience to know that you have great questions. We're just running out of time. Uh, let me just uh, give offer two things. Um, one is from Jeff Mason, who is the historian of the United Church of Christ Congregational in Arcade, New, Jersey, uh, New York. Uh, so Arcade is a rural village about 35 miles south of Buffalo. And he says, several of our pastors in the decades before the Civil War had studied at Oberlin, and some of our members participated in the Underground Railroad. One of our members, Charles Shepard, was one of the early figures in the Liberty Party, and he was said to be an associate of Reverend Ward. Our mm -hmm. church indicates that Ward officiated at a baptism in our church on February 11th, 1844. Does this time period fit in with your research on Ward's travels in Western New York? So maybe yes. a very specific question, but maybe- Yeah, yeah, well, I didn't know about that one. There's one, there's one. Um, that's a very useful bit of information. Uh, no, it, it does, it does. Um, as I said, the congregation in, in South Butler, that first church is made up, uh, as far as I can gather, uh, much of its membership comes uh, are migrants from from New England. Uh, so th they have a certain different approach to the, I mean, it's the only way to explain why they would actually offer Ward to be the, to be the, the minister of their congregation. Um, and th the connection with Oberlin would make sense mm -hmm. uh, later on. Um, because the, the, the name Shepherd is a, is a prominent Oberlin name anyway. Yep. Well, I'm going to send you the rest of these questions. We're at two o'clock <laughs> now. People, you know, so everybody in the audience is very excited for this work. I want to remind folks, uh, available now, uh, you can go ahead and order it directly from Yale. Uh, and you can also order it from Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and your local independent bookseller. Uh, thank you so much for writing this book. Uh, I think it's going to be well used. I know our copy here at the library is already getting dog-eared. So um, oh, good. thank you for doing this. And um, thanks to everybody out there for watching today. So it was a pleasure. And thanks for inviting me.